That picture makes the field station look a bit cold and bleak, doesn't it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> but it's sort of offset by is that someone sitting in a dressing gown on the dock? Yeah. Very cozy. In the, it presumably that was taken in a in a brief break in the in the weather. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. We, should we make a start? Yeah. Great. Well, hello, everyone. Thanks for uh, attending the next installment of this seminar series. So just a brief uh, welcome and introduction and to highlight that our um, 
iOS network is organizing a workshop to be held in Finland uh, early next year. So between the 30th of March and the 3rd of April. And the workshop will gather together uh, researchers, around 40 people, to consider how we can better integrate speciation research. And so this brief kind of introduction is just to advertise that the call is now open for applications for people who are interested in joining this workshop. And we really hope to gather together a, a really diverse set of participants representing different study organisms, methods used, career stages, and also um, uh, geographic location. And so we encourage applications from all career stages, including early career researchers, fellows, postdocs, and PhD students. So there's some brief information here, as you can see on the slide, but if you're interested in applying, please do visit our websites and the website link is shown here on the slide. And please uh, apply uh, by the 9th of uh, December, which is this Friday. So with that, I'll pass over to, uh, to our, our seminar introductions. Great, uh, thanks so much, Chris. Yeah, so uh, while Josh share, uh, shares his screen, um, I'm just gonna give him a brief introduction. So it really is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Josh Penalba from the Museum of Natural History in Berlin. Josh did his undergraduate degree at the University of California, California Berkeley, and then moved to the Australian National University for a PhD with Craig Moritz, where he studied the genomics of speciation in Australian birds. He then moved to LMU Munich to do a postdoc with Jochen Wolf where he studied hybridization in European crows. And so current work in Josh's research group aims to reveal the mechanisms and evolutionary processes underlying population divergence and speciation. Using genomic tools, he takes a comparative approach to dissect speciation by studying multiple systems at various points in the process. And so major themes include population genomics, biogeography, genome evolution, and the topic of today's talk, the analysis of hybrid zones. So with that, I'll just hand over to you, Josh. Thanks. Thanks for that introduction, Sean. Um, first of all, I wanted to thank the panelists for inviting me to this seminar series that I've been following quite diligently throughout these months. It's been really quite insightful, all of this uh, different talks and discussions we've been having so far. So um, with that, I'll go ahead and get started. So when I talk about studying divergence and hybridization through the speciation process, um, really talking about studying hybridization across these different kind of phases from a pandemic population to uh, early stages of speciation or divergence, and kind of later stages to kind of full speciation. So kind of getting all of the kind of gamuts in between, looking at kind of phenotypic divergence as well as genomic divergence as you kind of move through this process. And so here's a classic view the way a lot of us have when you have looking at different time points. But now we're trying to starting to view this through a kind of lens of a continuum. And the idea of this continuum is that it's not necessarily something that's unidirectional and something that kind of occurs bidirectionally. So you can have these kind of population pairs moving towards either side with gene flow and recombination kind of homogenizing divergence that, uh, that might have accumulated during allopatry. So you have mutation, selection, and drift moving things from one direction uh, and gene flow and recombination moving it to another. So I'm just moving the, the views of the panels. All right, so this kind of falls into two potential perspectives of the speciation process. You kind of have these stages or phases that a lot of people uh, like to talk about and this kind of continuum perspective. And it kind of harkens back to uh, Wu in 2002, looking at the genic view of speciation. So kind of starting off with two populations or one really just one panmictic population with full genetic exchange, you then might have two populations that might have some loci that are kind of uh, serving as barrier loci, not moving across. And this kind of divergence or restriction in gene flow start to spread across the genome until you don't have a lot of gene flow occurring across the genome. So you might have this as two different kind of perspectives of this process. But both of the things that kind of thematic across this is hybridization or gene flow. Uh, that's kind of getting more and more restricted as you have reproductive isolation accumulating through time. And so the kind of transitions are studies for, to understand speciation, really using hybrid zones and hybridization to understand this process moving from one population to two potentially full species. 
And so the way that at least I've been, we've been observing and studying natural hybridization and speciation now, we kind of have a demic perspective or a demic kind of uh, theme versus a spatial one. So kind of comparing the way two different ways that we might study this, demic individuals are assigned to kind of population state priori. So a lot of times you might think of this as more of a kind of two island model, a spatial, the individuals are then assigned to populations or geographic populations. So this would be more of a kind of stepping stone model um, and expanding from there. So like I mentioned, focus on two and the spatial is focused on kind of smaller subpopulations. So in DMIC, we tend to omit the hybrids. We kind of tend to focus more on pure or kind of um, uh, pure individuals within these populations. While in spatial, we really include a lot of the recent hybrids, F1s and all of the intergrades in between. DMIC, we get the kind of byproduct of gene flow and recombination through many, many generations. And while spatial kind of focuses a lot more on some of the more kind of recent generations through time. DMIC and sample, fewer samples are required. So in spatial, you tend to have a lot more samples required. So kind of just imagine the same two populations, except spanning it toward across geographic space. And again, you have sample kind of indiscriminately across space when you're looking at the populations in this perspective, in DMIC's perspective, and then you sample strategically across space when you're thinking of uh, spatial. And also the way we kind of do a lot of the analysis that we're doing kind of relies on or uh, uses these types of perspectives. So DMIC tends to have more tend to use the demographic models that we tend to do, FSD scans or other types of scans of the genome, um, kind of Patterson's D, Ababa, and so on, while spatial looks more at geographic clients or genomic clients and so on. And so once we bring that back into this kind of genic view of speciation that was, ooh, again, bring, bring all these different stages um, up, then we can start to bring in some of the kind of more modern perspectives that we have of speciation, genomic divergence, and the role of gene flow in that. So the first off I want to talk about is the idea of genome-wide congealing. So if you're focusing on these kind of loci that are in under uh, divergence selection or ecological selection um, on these two populations, early stages you might have kind of direct selection in this loci and then recombination kind of breaks down um, quite quickly. But as you have more and more accumulations of different kind of barrier loci, different incompatibilities across the genome, you have this kind of buildup of um, linkage equilibrium as you have as you move towards kind of full species or much more restricted gene flow between species. And so when we look at the genomic landscape differentiations, there's a, lo a lot of times that people want to do uh, this is isolating some of where these loci might be and some of the effects on the neighboring neutral loci. And of course, I'm sure a lot of you are already thinking of all the things that kind of confound this kind of ideal perspective that we might have, and I'll talk about that a little bit later on. But see, this is more of a, an exercise in terms of how we're starting to look at or think about or analyze a lot of these kind of speciation um, models that are a little bit more, again, in an ideal scenario. And so bringing in the spatial model, so we have these kind of geographic clines where you have, uh, if you're comparing Cross populations in geography, you might have some signals from isolation by distance or just kind of variation within the genome itself. Some loci start to show some type of restriction, and then it starts to accumulate throughout the genome. But again, this is not necessarily something that is kind of unidirectional, moving from left to right, but then you can have um, kind of movements on either side depending on the dynamics of gene flow and allopatric time. And so this kind of goes back into in terms of like a first three, looking more in the demic perspective and the last of which uh, uh, looking more in the spatial perspective. And so these are really focusing on just a few kind of samples across this kind of speciation continuum. But once we start to get a lot more samples or a lot more comparisons, we then start to kind of shed a little bit more light on what's going on across this process. So one of the studies that's been kind of brought up a lot is this kind of gray zone speciation um, that was studied by Camille Wu. So this is did about 61 comparisons and looking at the probability of migration and how this kind of transitions through divergence. And so a lot of the times when we're studying kind of speciation or speciation continuum, we tend to use divergence as a proxy for, um, uh, may use divergence as a proxy for reproductive isolation or uh, I guess um, kind of signal for it just because it's a lot more difficult to really have that as a metric to kind of study across different taxa. So, yeah, take it as you may in terms of what necessarily translates and how it kind of converts between divergence and reproductive isolation. I'll be bringing that up a little bit as well. 
And so underlying this gray zone of speciation is the idea that you have this rapid transition where they have high, high probability of migration um, at early stages to the middle and a very rapid kind of tipping point towards really low probabilities of migration. And so what's kind of underlying this may be this kind of accumulation of incompatibilities. It's kind of idea of tipping point dynamics where you might have this accumulation of uh, different incompatibilities in the genome could occur in a much more also similar tipping point dynamics. But this kind of product, this byproduct of lower probability of migration could still be a byproduct of a linear accumulation of incompatibilities or nonlinear uh, accumulation. That really depends on kind of how we might view the effects of these incompatibilities on the resulting hybrids and what kind of how deleterious they might be if you have uh, multiple or just a few. And so this also kind of addresses a little bit this idea of reversibility of speciation, or it might be we're thinking about the instability of intermediate stages. So maybe some other sides of this kind of gray zone of speciation are much more stable, and being around kind of midpoint kind of is more of an unstable uh, state. So that might not necessarily lead to a collapse of speciation or something that might proceed to more reproductive isolation. Maybe not necessarily complete on either end, um, but this kind of in-between state is not necessarily the most uh, stable state. And so we can kind of really just build up all of these kind of different perspectives or views together. And I'm sure a lot of you can start thinking of, the, um, of your own that you're kind of interested in or have been studying and kind of just appending that to this list and really kind of how we might use that to view these kind of from pandemic populations of full, uh, potential full species and everything in between. And so, you know, the, I've been talking about this uh, for a few minutes now, we've been doing a lot of uh, this ideas mainly with two kind of 2D models or pairwise comparisons, again, with a DMIC and spatial, but of course, uh, nature is not really that kind of straightforward. So a lot of the times really what's happening is you have more of a kind of 2D spatial meta populations, different relationships, different clinal variation, different restrictions and amounts of gene flow. And even more complicated under that is kind of this complex demographic histories, extinction, um, populations coming together, splitting apart and so on. And of course, it's really quite difficult at least uh, my, my opinion nowadays to really kind of get at this complexity uh, given the tools that we have, but um, you know, we're trying at least to get as much as we can in terms of the patterns that we can extract from the comparisons we're making. And so now focusing in more on hybrid zones or that kind of main topic of this discussion. So we have hybrid zones kind of displaying phenotype through space. And we also have um, the ecological context that we can measure and kind of put this phenotype in a particular perspective. So it's been called natural laboratories, kind of testing this degree of reproductive isolation, as well as kind of the movement of this kind of phenotype and interactions across geographic space. And so once we bring in our genomic tools, we start to be able to observe ancestry through space. So I mean, that kind of starts off already with the genetics and slowly getting into this kind of dynamics of introgression through geographic space, once we break down the different genes and um, genomic regions. And so, like I mentioned before, it's, you know, I've been making it sound much more simple than it actually is when you have a lot of these different types of kind of factors playing a role. Um, so various forms of selection, logical, sexual, linked selection, compatibilities, different kind of dynamics of demographic history, geography, and, and as well as which genomic features you're looking at and how they're kind of affected in different ways. And so as kind of speciation biologists, we really like to you know, try to control for a lot of these things and try to see like, okay, how does this one thing affect speciation or how does this one thing affect hybridization, but it's really difficult in natural systems to kind of control for all of these things. So we try to you know, do our best, but it's, it's really quite <laughs> challenging in that sense. And so bring this kind of uh, kind of meta figure back up, of course, all of these different factors are affecting what we view here. Another factor that I haven't brought up um, or kind of just a little bit uh, alluded to a little bit is that if you have kind of populations coming into, going into allopatry and secondary contact, you might kind of end up uh, you might be reflecting a kind of early stage of divergence or early stage of speciation, but then if the populations just came into secondary contact and we catch it right at that time, it might appear as though, and we're looking at genomic tools, it might appear as though there's there are sharp clients. It's just had not enough generations have passed yet to kind of really reflect what's going on in terms of the actual incompatibilities or the dynamics of the reproductive isolation of the focal populations. 
So then you might really be looking at kind of different time points and jumping around these kind of different um, different stages that you might say are different kind of points of the continuum, depending on whether or not the populations are already are, are already in equilibrium or just kind of approaching it. And even so, after you've reached equilibrium, how does this, uh, how these two populations might proceed through time? Would it stay in this kind of state for a little bit and then slowly kind of collapse through or would it actually accumulate uh, more kind of isolating mechanisms through time? And you might still have a different dynamics in terms of how the geography might play a role in the future, more um, pulses of allopatry and parapatry and so on. So it's really quite complicated and we're trying to extract as much signal as we can from the data we're in this uh, systems that we have. And so kind of going into this kind of suture zone dynamic. So for those who are not too familiar with the term, suture zones were initially introduced as this kind of collection of hybrid zones clustering in geographic space. So initially um, introduced by Remington in 1968. And this definition was expanded uh, in terms of including contact zones, phylogeographic breaks, and kind of uh, geographic clustering in geographic space. And that kind of expands it to kind of earlier, potentially earlier stages of um, divergence, as well as later stages and so on. And so the idea is that you might have these kind of populations or species pairs with a shared climatic history and geography that might potentially reflect the dif uh, different stages across the continuum of speciation. So ideally, then you can kind of start to study this across a shared uh, geography. And so then studying uh, hybrid zones or a single hybrid zone, we're really looking at a single snapshot of time and the idea of studying suture zones, and then you're able to look at multiple snapshots in the same geography. And the same can be said if you're looking at different hybrid zones across uh, kind of different locations at, when you're comparing two of the same populations or two of the same lineages that might meet at different points. Um, but here it's kind of focusing on different close enough related groups, but in a particular geographic space. And so what are the, some of the advantages of, well, advantages of studying suture zones? First of all, uh, the idea is that they have a shared climatic history. They have a shared geographic context. And really, I started this off because it's kind of convenient field sampling. So you don't have to go across. If you have limited time, you can do, you can sample multiple kind of species in the same geographic space and kind of fewer field, um, field uh, events, field sampling events. And so what can we actually learn from suture zones? So you might see some different responses to a similar context, different movements of genes across geographic space, as well as the potential variation degree in reproductive isolation. And of course, like I mentioned, studying speciation, um, at least trying to study this kind of speciation in the continuum aspect, you don't necessarily, of course, have to study it. Across the suture zone, there are lots of studies now that are appearing looking at more meta-analysis across different groups, or again, looking at contacts of the same lineages at different geographic locations. Uh, this is another perspective that I find kind of uh, convenient for the sampling I need to do. And so delving into some of the projects that I've been working on, so I'll be talking a little bit about some projects that have already finished as well as some projects that are kind of ongoing, but a bit kind of been in the back burner. So it actually, it's been a while since I've revisited it. So it might be good to kind of spark up some discussions later on and it'd be great to get some advice. So there's a few preliminary stuff that might come up uh, as I go. So the questions I'm interested in addressing are how, how rapidly does gene flow decrease with divergence? How does hybrid zone width correlate with divergence? And which evolutionary history is consistent with the patterns in the suture zone? And so we're delving, we're kind of taking this trip to Australia, where a lot of these avian suture zones have already been established with phenotype back in 1986. And so the idea with these suture zones is that you have these areas of endemism, climate refugia, and biogeographical barriers that then reflect kind of divergence in ecology, periods of isolation, and barriers to gene flow. And the group they'll be talking about are a series of uh, different bird species across this superfamily called Melophagides. So diving right into it, how rapidly does gene flow decrease or divergence? So this is a study uh, I did a while back sampling across four populations, Papua New Guinea um, and three populations across Northern Australia. The idea being these populations have this different relationships of allopatry and parapatry or different kind of ranges of connectivity. So the idea, the initial motivation for this study was to look at how kind of genome divergence might accumulate given these two different types of geographical contexts. So this is uh, more DDRAD sampling, so reduced representation of the genome. And I sampled 
species that have kind of different ranges of mitochondrial divergence, hoping that it might reflect different stages of um, kind of different kind of nuclear divergence as well as different stages of speciation. Again, this is more of just a kind of the initial check-in, but hoping that it kind of gets to that, um, addresses that. So here is looking at kind of harkens to Camille Roux's gray zone, uh, gray zone of speciation. So looking at kind of these demographic models with and without migration. So the without migration looking more at strict allopatry and ancient migration, and then with migration is more of the isolation of migration and secondary contact and varying the amounts of kind of effective population size of the different loci to affect, to kind of reflect variation and recombination rates and link selection, as well as variation and heterogene, heterogeneity of gene flow within the genome. The idea of which also reflects this kind of likelihood of gene flow in the end. So you have zero with no models kind of supporting the idea of gene flow. So you have all of them um, without migration. And if you have a value of one, 100% of the models that we have in a particular pairwise comparison is with migration. So um, that would give us a value of one. And so again, looking at these kind of different stages or different um, time points, that my kind of assumption was that if you have populations diverging in allopatry, then you have this kind of zero likelihood of gene flow occurring throughout time um, until it's full, fully isolated. But if you have populations diverging in parapatry, kind of lower divergences in early stages, you might have this kind of high likelihood of gene flow in this kind of sharp transition afterwards. So once we juxtapose the difference, kind of pairwise comparisons of these populations, what I find is that these kind of designations of allopatry and parapatry are not really reflective. And a lot of these populations are following this one particular trend. Again, consistent with a trend that um, Camille Rue has published um, in their paper. And so that also kind of harkens to this idea this, that contemporary allopatry and parapatry might not necessarily reflect this kind of dynamics of kind of connectivity and allopatry through time. And at least for these populations and a lot of populations we're studying, it's likely that you have multiple pulses of gene flow and, and restriction of gene flow that might not necessarily be easily kind of teased apart for using the genomic data. And so then kind of follow this up with modeling how this might kind of change through time. So this kind of harkens to these the five different models from Yamaguchi and Wasa. And so it's really looking at, okay, what, how do we best kind of reflect this? Is it more of a kind of threshold model? This quick transition is a constant accelerating, um, decelerating, and so on. So it's kind of just fitting these different, different trajectories through the, the data that we have. And so in the end, the best models that were kind of recovered from this analysis were accelerating and sigmoidal. And so here it's kind of suggesting it's kind of slow, rapid, a slow start with a rapid accumulation, but there's kind of a disagreement in how the completion ends. And it's really because there's not enough data points to reflect that. So the metrics here that um, I was using was FST just to reflect this, uh, or just to reflect the models that was kind of presented in Yamaguchi and it was in 2017. So both kind of, both axes are then bound by zero and one. So the second question, look at how does hybrid zone with correlate with divergence? So this looks more at a kind of a transect across 10 different hybrid zones in Northeastern Australia, again, look at sampling populations that I might think have a range of different divergences and using DDRAT across them. And so with that, um, I did kind of standard NGS admix to look at kind of admixture proportions. So to so then reflect the variation of extent of hybridization across geographic space. So you use all the SNPs rather than just the ancestry informative ones. So it's more of a non-biased way to observe the effects on all the low side. And then we follow this by looking at the Klein width using the admixture proportions rather than kind of the differences in allele frequencies. And really a limitation was the number of sampling that we can do with given that we had to do this with uh, 10 systems. But I'm hoping to follow this up eventually with much more uh, denser sampling. And so again, looking at Klein width as being proportional to dispersal distance selection, a lot of these birds are quite similar and looking at the dispersal distances amongst them, they do um, quite reflect quite similar dispersal distances. So really what we're getting at is the variation of selection um, across these different systems. So when I compare the divergence of these kind of allopatric populations or po populations at either end of our transect, so kind of omitting all of the hybrids. So then I guess you might think of this again as this an endemic model. And then comparing that to the hybrid zone width, what we see is this kind of rapid transition. So lower FST and lower, and this is reflected with other values of divergence such as D and DXY. 
So you have this kind of much wider hybrid zones, much uh, lower FSCs and divergence, and a quite rapid transition to kind of narrower hybrid zones. And if again, also looking at mitochondrial, at lower levels of divergence, you have kind of much more variation and really quickly transitions to uh, narrow hybrid zones. And so what this says is that we have, what this tells us that you have hybrid diverged populations have more geographically restricted gene flow. This is drastically reduced with a marginal increase in divergence. So the last question is how, which evolutionary history is consistent with the patterns in the suture zone? Um, so again, this looks at the same system, except looking at it in a different perspective. So this uses kind of slim, three simulations and then show us, okay, what are some of the potential evolutionary mechanisms that could have driven this? So I might have to kind of speed through this. So maybe something that we might be able to discuss later on. Um, again, this is more of the preliminary stuff. So it'll be great to get a bit of advice on this as well. So the different models I've been looking at uh, were different times in secondary contact, so varying times in equilibrium, different degrees of contact, so the kind of different varying permeabil permeability of the barriers, as well as different times in allopatry. So this kind of different divergence, uh, mutual divergence, as well as the different accumulations of compatibilities. So just designing these simulations, so we had this kind of simple stepping stone model of 36 populations. And I kind of did it this way so that we could actually see or observe some of the variation due to isolation by distance, keeping a lot of these different metrics consistent throughout. Of course, you might point out that these might not necessarily be consistent with the systems that we have. We're trying to see really what are some of the signals we might pick up. Um, given the different contexts that we uh, are given. So then we have this accumulation of incompatibilities and this effect of hybrid fitness is that as you have more incompatibilities, you have this kind of drastic effect of the fitness of the hybrids. Though the accumulation of incompatibility is more of a constant rate at this stage. So we have these different variables in terms of migration rate, times of ballopatry, and times of secondary contact, and, um, uh, and it's kind of purely neutral versus incompatible loci. So then we simulate your ancestral population, a period of allopatry, so kind of just restricting the gene flow between the um, two populations there, and then secondary contact and sampling across different time points. And so comparing this with empirical data then of this kind of narrower hybrid zones and FSD, as well as FSD of populations closer to the contact zone to uh, allopatric populations, like I was showing earlier. And so kind of diving right into it, so if you look at these different panels, the idea here is that the points re reflect the different times since secondary contact. The incompatibility are not necessarily all loci are incompatible, but rather some of the loci within these genomes are incompatible and most of them are neutral, while the purely neutral ones, the ones that are gray, all of the loci within that are uh, purely neutral. And the different panels reflect different times of allopatry. Um, so as we see here with the different times of secondary contact, it, this, the simulations don't quite reflect what we see in our empirical data in terms of the pattern of more kind of linear um, accumulation with FSD and contact zone versus allopatry, as well as this transition of the hybrid zone width. So now looking at the different degrees of contact, we also see a different pattern that doesn't quite reflect what we see in the empirical data. It's a little bit more kind of linear and staying kind of consistent. Um, and the last of which that was, at least for these models that I was able to um, recover are these different time points in allopatry are the ones that reflect the empirical data the closest so far. So I, I'm sure a lot of you might come up with some ideas that might help with this a little bit, uh, but at least the idea here is that um, particularly the models where incompatibilities are included in our mutations, you have a much more kind of this transition of this kind of hybrid zone with decreasing as you increase FSD of the allopatric populations and a more linear relationship of the FSD of the contact zone and the um, allopatric populations. So at least for these models, which evolutionary history is consistent with a pattern of the suture zones, different times in isolation and amount of incompatibilities. Again, this is a preliminary um, disclaimer. And so some of the things we can change is just how incompatibilities accumulate as well as the effect on hybrid fitness and so on. So I'm looking forward to getting some of your thoughts on that. And so just quickly, some of the challenges in comparative studies increased in required sampling. Each comparison is kind of reduced to a single data point. And they, we tend to neglect a lot of biological variation and how much can we actually neglect, choosing which systems are actually comparable and the kind of the generalizability of results, we kind of restrict it to these populations of birds. Is this actually 
generalizable to kind of plants or things that are a lot less fragile, choosing comparable metrics. But anyway, with that, sorry again for zooming through, but hopefully, I don't know if I'll have enough time for questions, but if not, I'm looking forward to our discussion later on for some additional questions. Okay, <clears throat> great. Thanks so much, Josh. Really uh, stimulating talk. Definitely lots to think about and discuss. Uh, we will move on though for now and uh, we'll try and cover some questions in the main discussion. So I'll just hand over to Roger. Ah, yes. Thanks, Sean. Anna, would you like to share your screen now? So, so it's a great pleasure to introduce our second speaker today, Anna Runemark. Um, Anna did her PhD in Lund and then moved to Oslo for a postdoc and is now back in Lund running her, her own group. Um, her background is in evolutionary ecology and evolutionary genetics. Um, while she was in Oslo, she did some fantastic work on the hybrid speciation in the Italian sparrow, which is which is very well known. Um, but now she's uh, started up her, her own study system with a tefritted fruit fly looking at plant associated uh, divergence. And I think in both of those systems, she's been using gene expression as one sort of approach to the consequences of hybridization. And uh, we're gonna hear a bit about that today. So um, over to you, Anna. Thanks so much for that really kind introduction. And uh, are you seeing my screen in a good way now? We are, yes, thanks. Thanks so much. And thanks also for letting me come here and talk about my research interests today. And since it was supposed to be an idea talk, I'm going to be sharing one of the wildest ideas that I've been thinking about lately. So I've been increasingly fascinated by gene expression. I, I would love to hear your opinions on these ideas. Um, so as most biologists, I'm fascinated by the diversity of adaptations that arise in nature. And my main research interest is to understand how these adaptations can arise um, the, and how the variation that selection can act on to achieve these adaptations arise. And hybridization is increasingly recognized as an important contributor of novel combinations of alleles and variation. And, and the revolution of sequencing methods has spurred research showing that hybridization occurs in a high percentage of both plants, as was recognized early on, but also of animals. And it's a, uh, in some systems, it can be an even more important source of novel variation than mutation. And it's been shown to give rise to this amazing adaptive radiations, for instance, in Lake Victoria cichlids. And we don't even need to go beyond this Zoom meeting to see that uh, organisms with hybrid histories thrive. And even small amounts of introgression can have large fitness effects. So for instance, our COVID prognosis is um, affected by the alleles we inherited from Neanderthals. So if you get the nature allele, it's bad news if you contract COVID and the PNAS allele is good news. And why study hybridization in particular? Well, variation from hybridization differs from that of mutation. For instance, hybridization can transfer large co-adapted gene complexes, and the variants transferred by hybridization have already been tested by selection in a similar genomic background in a closely related species. And this can enable different types of evolutionary responses, such as heterosis or transgression, and I'll come back to that. And just to briefly um, um, mentioned that there's many different outcomes of hybridization in particular, um, depending on the properties of the hybridizing taxa and settings. But today I'll focus on hybrid speciation. And hybrid speciation arises when two diverged parental lineages um, hybridize and form a third lineage that achieves reproductive isolation to its parent species. And it comes in two different flavors. There's a homoploid hybrid speciation where there's no increase in the number of chromosomes. And then there's allopolyploid hybrid speciation with a doubling of the number of chromosomes. <laughs> 
And as we increasingly understand the distribution of introgression along the genome, uh, with lower amounts of introgression in low recombination regions and sex chromosomes and so forth, I'm starting to think that maybe it could be interesting to see how, uh, how the distribution of introgressed variants can affect gene expression. And I hope that I can get uh, or wake some interest in this uh, in this talk. So transgression is a well documented pattern in hybrids, and it's a phenotype that's more extreme compared to both parental species. Here illustrated by the overall larger and differently colored uh, bird. And uh, uh, the Helianthus animalis hybrid taxon has a transgressive ecophysiology and is an iconic example. So the ecophysiology enables it to live in even drier and uh, more arid environments than its two parent species. So I argued that this kind of is a gap between the transgressive hybrid phenotypes and the intermediate hybrid genomes. And typically this has been this gap has been explained as complementary combinations of alleles with encoding genes or complementary gene action. But I think it's interesting to observe that gene expression is altered in hybrids. And it's been studied in many F1 hybrids because it enables us to compare um, the regulatory basis of different genes. So, and mis misexpression in F1 hybrids is a common cause of sterility. Moreover, in both humans and primates, we find selection against introgression of regulatory elements, suggesting that there are changes to gene expression arising when these elements from the different parental background introgress. And um, finally, there's been some findings of stronger misexpression in back-crossed hybrids than in F1s uh, that I find interesting and we'll get back to. And even in um, stabilized hybrids, hybrid species, uh, there are funky patterns of gene expression. So in allopolyploids, it's well established that subgenome dominance can arise uh, when one parent species gene um, um, or the gene expression in one parent species is very similar to that in the hybrid. And in the very few studies, that exist, it seems that gene expression also changes in homoploid hybrids. But what got me really excited was this finding in Capsella bursa pastoris. Um, it's a weed, it's an allopolyploid, and they found that the patterns of subgenome dominance varied with the tissue investigated. So just to walk you through the figure, the blue uh, triangles is one parental species gene expression, the red triangles is the other, and this uh, allopolyploid weed is the yellow uh, diamonds. And as you can see, in flowers it resembles one parent species, whereas for leaves and roots it resembles the other parent species. And the parent species that it resembles in the flower has a pollination ecology that's more similar. So that made me think, what if gene expression can potentially uh, evolve in an adaptive manner following hybridization. So to, to give some brief background, gene expression generally evolves uh, or evolves under stabilizing selection simplified. So typically transregulatory change is compensated by cis, uh, opposing cis-regulatory change. And very simple gene expression is regulated both by distal transregulatory elements and proximate uh, cis regulatory elements. And typically, there's many transregulatory elements involved, uh, but I keep it uh, to one here for the simple uh, for the readability of the figure. So what happens in hybrids is that co-evolved cis and transregulatory elements may break up. 
And really simplified, if the transregulatory elements evolve in one direction, and this is compensated by cis regulatory change, what can happen is that different combinations of trans and cis regulatory elements may result in the same gene expression. And here I illustrated this with two minus alleles reducing gene expression in this blue bird species and two plus alleles that increases it. Um, and that yields the same gene expression as the red parent species that has this two plus alleles in trans, but minus alleles in cis instead. And in the first generation hybrids, there will of course be dominance effects and so forth, but they will have an intermediate combination of these regulatory alleles. However, in the second and following generations of um, birds or of organisms, there's a potential for these regulatory elements to sort in a transgressive way with an overall higher number of pluses or minuses resulting in um, higher or lower overall gene expression. So I set out to test this uh, idea, whether if there would be transgressive gene expression in hybrids in the Italian sparrow. And this is work that I started uh, during a time as my postdoc, as a postdoc in the Glenn Peter Satras lab in Oslo. And uh, then my postdoc, Homa Papoliasti, and I have continued working on gene expression in the Italian sparrow. So just to give you some background, the Italian sparrow is a homoploid hybrid. Um, the parent species are house sparrow and Spanish sparrow, and it's phenotypically intermediate, and the genome is intermediate of those of the parent species. And the parent species diverged some 0 0.8 million years ago, and um, the hybridization took place as the house sparrow spread to Europe some 5,000 years ago. So this is a stabilized hybrid species. So we looked into the gene expression in testes, and what we would have expected from an intermediate genome would be these yellow dots only. That would be the gene expression is within the range of either of the two parental species, not outside both parental species range. But we find many genes that are more expressed in the hybrid than in both parent species, as illustrated by this high value of the Italian sparrow to, uh, to parent species ratio on both axes. And we also find genes that are less expressed in the hybrid Italian sparrow than in both parent species. Interestingly, we found these large differences in the testes, and the testes are in the left uh, uh, column here. And you can see that uh, the testes, the gene expression differs strongly against both house sparrow and Spanish sparrow. In contrast, the ovary was very similar to the house sparrow ovary in gene expression. And when we looked at the functions that were overrepresented among the transgressively expressed genes, the genes that were overexpressed in the hybrid Italian sparrow, we found that there were genes from the mitochondrial respiratory chain, cytosolic and mitochondrial ribosomal proteins, and proteins involved in binding to this, uh, the sperm to the zona pellucida, for instance. And these findings are very consistent with what we know about hybrids and metabolism in general, and about the Italian sparrow in particular, because mitonuclear genes have been shown not only to be involved as a, a reproductive isolation barriers against the parent species, but also uh, to be under selection in the hybrid Italian sparrow. And having these being more highly expressed uh, makes sense in that regard. And genes involved in the trick complex were also overexpressed. And the trick complex folds approximately 10% of the proteome. And um, it's also uh, subunits that are required for spermatogenesis. And Melissa Rowe performed a sperm proteome study and found uh, the trick complex to be under selection in the Italian sparrow. So that it's overexpressed is also very interesting. 
So does this translate into phenotypic uh, transgression, these patterns of gene expression? Well, that's a question we haven't been as, uh, able to answer yet. I think the best way to get at that would be to look into the kind of processes uh, that we find uh, transgressive gene expression for and uh, see if the characters we expect them to affect uh, are transgressive. But we do have some suggestions that the Italian sparrow have uh, some transgressive phenotypes. So we looked at a bunch of mainland Italian sparrow populations, the marked in green, and some island Italian sparrow populations in yellow-red scale. Um, this is a PCA of the whole genome composition with the house sparrow in blue and the Spanish sparrow in red. And um, uh, these, pat uh, these figures here have the house sparrow, the one parent in blue, and the Spanish sparrow, the other parent in red. And as you can see in beak shape, for instance, an intermediate phenotype would result in the green and yellow uh, Italian sparrow um, distributions being intermediate. But if you look, for instance, for beaks at beak size, you can see that the sizes of the beaks of the Italian sparrows, both in mainland populations and island populations, are outside of both parental ranges. And we also find some indications that rump coloration is different uh, from both parental species, both in the mainland and island populations, but in different directions. So we also find um, transgressive phenotypes. So are the expression differences adaptive then? Well, the Italian sparrow have undergone some 5,000 years of genome stabilization, and they outcompeted both their parental species. And one of them is the world's most invasive bird, the house sparrow. So I would say that the patterns of gene expression that we recover are likely not misexpression, at least. Um, but in order to understand what these gene expression patterns actually are about and whether they're adaptive, uh, I think we need to find repeated outcomes to infer general patterns um, to see what's adaptive. And luckily, there are the, uh, lineages of the Italian sparrow that are divergent. So this is a principal component analysis of whole genome data from Italian sparrows, uh, with the house sparrow to the left, the Spanish sparrow to the right, and the Italian sparrow populations uh, being separated genomically. And these populations of uh, Italian sparrow are not only different, but they also have different proportion of the two parental genomes, uh, ranging from 25% house sparrow DNA to almost 75% house sparrow DNA uh, in these different populations. And if you perform independent phylogenetic analyses of different sections of the genome, it will result in a pattern that is this gray blur here. So each of these lines in the gray blur is an is a one type of phylogenetic tree. So there are many different phylogenetic trees, meaning that the same region of the genome is not always inherited from the same parental species. Um, and the black bars are basically just the most common phylogeny. So basically this means that uh, these genomes have stabilized independently. So my plan would be to use many lineages of hy hybrid Italian sparrows to find out what gene expression phenotypes are transgressive. Uh, in parallel, in particular, are there types of genes that always are transgressively expressed across all these four different lineages of a hybrid Italian sparrow? Um, and the most interesting thing to me is whether we can actually predict which networks are going to be differentially expressed or transgressively expressed, if there are certain functions of genes that are uh, more prone to be transgressively expressed, and whether the regulatory basis can predict whether genes are di differentially or transgressively expressed, so whether it's under cis regulation mainly, trans regulation mainly, or cis trans compensatory regulation. And hybrid genomes have other changes that might be relevant in terms of gene expression as well. So for instance, if two parental genomes combine that have smaller structural differences, this might may generate structural changes in hybrid genomes. Um, there might 
also be transmissible element releases with either more copies or more expression of transmissible elements if they decouple from their suppressors. And some empirical findings in whitefish suggest that methylation may uh, be different in hybrid genomes. And all of these um, different factors are affecting gene expression. So I would be very interested in looking into their effects as well. But to wrap up, so does it even matter if the pluses and minuses in this complementary uh, gene action are coding alleles or regulatory elements? Well, while coding alleles can, um, can of course be involved in epistatic combinations, expressed meat genes may regulate other genes and affect entire networks. Um, so I think it might. So in conclusion, hybridization may give rise to novel patterns of gene expression. And an interesting question is whether these can actually serve as substrate for adaptation and whether they could be important for hybridization derived phenotypic novelty. So I would like to thank this Barry crew, Glenn Peter Sattre, my brilliant postdoc Homa, who's made some of these analyses, collaborators, Mark, Melissa, Fabrice and Cassie, and of course you for listening. Yeah, and the speciation adaptation and co-evolution lab at Lund University that they run together with Magna Friba and Aston Oppedal, of course. Thanks so much for listening. Thank you very much, Anna. Um, I think we have a few minutes for some um, specific talk-related questions. And um, while people think about that, I might just start off myself. I, I mean, picking up on something you said in one of your latest slides. Um, if you see transgressive expression in quite a large number of of transcripts, it's actually you know they might all be involved in a few networks, I suppose. So we don't know how much genetic change is really underlying that that um, exactly cloud of expressed genes. Do you, do you have any way of getting at that? Or, yeah. Um. Yeah. So I th I think we would need to understand more about how the networks. Uh, work specifically, whether there would be key alleles that actually, uh, or like key genes that actually could affect um, the entire network if that is differentially expressed. So the level of differential expression that we recovered here was quite surprising. Um, mm. uh, but uh, as the, you saw in this slide with, um, with the enriched fun functions, the differentially expressed genes were actually enriched for a few specific functions. Yep. Yep. Nick is asking in, in the chat what happens in F1s. Do, do you know that for the sparrows? Yeah, so we tried really hard. Um, so we had uh, collaborators in, um, in uh, Spain um, that actually bred these hybrids for us. They spent almost two years and then it turned out that the parental species had been um, hybridizing. So there was a Z chromosome that was not what we expected. Um, and so we, we have been interpreting these data with some caution or with a lot of caution because they are not really F1s, they are early generation hybrids. Um, so unfortunately, we, we don't have a very good answer to that, but they had a lower level of misexpression uh, or like they had a lower level of differential expression compared to the parent species than the Italian sparrow, actually. Thanks. Uh, Nick, did you want to come back in there? Oh, it was just actually a more a theoretical question from the slide yeah. that in the slide you had a sort of plus minus for the cis effects yes. um, in the F1, but actually half the cis will be plus and half will be minus. So presumably yeah. if there's incompatibility, um, you know, half of the genes will be overexpressed and half underexpressed. Does that make a difference or can you pick that up? Um, probably if not. If it makes a difference whether genes are overexpressed or underexpressed. Well, it's just that from the slide, my first impression yeah. is that everything is balanced, plus minus, plus minus, it's all interbeded, everyone's happy. But oh, yeah. trans, it's a bit different, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. So, and that is, I do not have a very good answer to that. There are, are of co course, dominance effects. Um, mm -hmm. And there could be other types of incompatibilities. I mean, that mitonuclear incompatibilities have been shown to be causing misexpression to a high extent. Um, and that's not like, uh, that's that's not half-half. Um, but 
I do not have a better answer than that yeah. the, like mitonuclear incompatibilities and dominance effects may be a start for an answer, but I think we need to understand this better. I think a lot of the studies of F1 misexpression have basically been trying to get at um, is this, uh, uh, the regulation of um, um, so how the genes in, uh, are actually regulated or the expression of the genes is regulated in the study taxa. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. no, but, yeah. But if anybody has a good explanation, I would be delighted to hear it. Mm -hmm. um, just before we move on, can I ask just one other question about, you mentioned these island populations which have different mixes of um, house and Spanish. Yeah. And, 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 and you said that um, often it's not the same parts of the genome, but I, I'm just wondering how much of the genome is consistently inherited in a, in a particular direction in, in the hybrids. Um, so we, we find, so I'm, I'm being, uh, I'm skipping to an extra slide here, but this is a sliding window admixture along the Z chromosome. So we find places in the Z chromosome, um, and for instance, where there's only house bearer DNA, and those are enriched for um, mitonuclear genes and DNA repair genes, basically. So that would be, uh, that would be 